Good evening. This is Rajan Ravel from SEPT University. I'm glad that uh, Meenu Agrawal has agreed to offer this webinar, uh, which is based on building performance. Uh, Meenu is uh, adjunct assistant professor at SEPT University. Uh, by qualification, she is an architect from IIT Roorkee and a postgrad from Carnegie Mellon University, in US. Uh, she has about uh, 10 years of experience in the in the industry and then later she did her PhD recently about a year back from EPFL Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, her primary interest is on building performance more towards uh, design stages or early design stage as well as expertise in uh, daylighting models and so on and so forth. Uh, she also uh, teaches two prominent course at MTech BEP program, except one which deals with the daylighting and one which deals with the whole building performance simulation. Uh, so thanks, Minu, for agreeing to offer this and over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. And thank you for inviting me to this series. Uh, very happy to be here. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here. So um, I'm going to talk about some work that I did during my PhD and how it has evolved over the last one year. Uh, and yeah, the title is Building Performance Simulation Based Design Decisions. And what are the chances that you are making the correct decisions um, using building performance simulation? So building performance simulation um, I think I'm uh, assuming that most attendees here today um, have uh, cross paths uh, with this with this term here. Um, building performance simulation tools have become an important um, tool for assessing performance while the building is still being conceptualized and as the design process unrolls and afterwards as well uh, can offer support. Um, when we are using these these tools, these um, simulation platforms, we are essentially mimicking the building physics into in, in terms of mathematical models that um, then we are using to, uh, I guess, optimize design performance, optimize controls, things like that. But anytime we are using a simulation tool, most of the time what we want to do is make decisions. But sometimes, I guess, and I would say, some users may forget at times that all these decisions that we are making using simulation tools are being made under uncertainty. Because um, you know, these, these simulation tools are meant to mimic reality uh, and um, also we are and then we are in no position to um, uh, recreate reality in these simulation tools. So we are certainly working under a lot of uncertainty when we rely on the outputs from these simulation tools. So before I get into you know, the nuances of making decisions using the building performance tools, I thought it will be nice to have a more generic sort of situation where, say for example, this person wants to get to a particular point and has to choose, has to make a decision between which road to take, okay? Um, this is a simple kind of decision. You know, you choose you know, this road on the left or the right. And what would you do in a, such a situation? Well, I'd, I'd look at Google Maps and tell me, uh, and Google Maps can tell me information like this. Huh? Um, route B or route B takes one hour, 50 minutes. Another one takes one hour, 35 minutes. I'll probably choose route A, you know, shorter path, why not? Uh, but Google Maps is also acting on information that it has now. Uh, let's say I go down path A and 10 minutes into this road, I find that actually a tree has fallen over and this road is now completely blocked and I have to turn back and go back to path B. Google Maps didn't have this information when I, I checked for this path because perhaps nobody had passed this way before me. Um, nobody had that information. And so now I'm turning back from path A and I'm like, why didn't I just take path B? I wish I knew that this tree had, there was this road blockage. I wish Google Maps knew, and now I'm, just, I'm going back. Um, and this sort of, and here is an example of uncertainty where, uh, you know, a decision, a simple decision like this with 
you know, clear information presented to me is also plagued by uncertainty. And in this case, I would perhaps regret, you know, experience a minor regret in choosing path A, maybe slightly annoyed, turn back, go to path B. Uh, in fact, Google Maps actually calculates and assesses its own performance in suggesting routes using this concept of regret. The word regret itself is intuitive, intuitive, you know, it fits the situation, you know, that I experienced regret in choosing path A and I'm like, why did I even follow Google Maps? Um, but here, Google will quantify regret in terms of the minutes that you lost uh, because of a sort of low quality uh, assessment that Google Maps gave. So here is an example of information that on face value seems very specific, but is also uh, suffering from uncertainty and incompleteness of information that Google Maps has and can lead to user regret. Similar situations can, involve, it can unfold when you are using simulation tools as well. So I'll just illustrate that through a few examples. But I, I thought this um, particular quote from a paper um, says this much more eloquently than I could, uh, that you know the design process, uh, and in brackets I would say, when using building performance simulation tools, can be viewed as a series of decisions made under uncertainty. And so anytime we are using tool, simulation tools, we are essentially making decisions under uncertainty. Now, when it comes to decision-making under uncertainty, using simulation tools, we have, we generally try to classify this uncertainty into two ways. Uh, epistemic uncertainty, that is uncertainty from unknowns that can be known, but it takes effort and time, and which we don't, sometimes it's not possible, sometimes it's just not the norm, or yeah, sometimes it costs time and money. So for example, um, some of the building physics can be simplified or is simplified. Uh, we don't exactly, um, we have not been able to exactly uh, map down the, the physics and we can rely on empirical results uh, to, um, to specify and um, these, um, Building physics phenomena, for example, you know, maybe the very Ben Lowe and Bernoulli's equation is also an empirical um, formula, empirically derived formula. It doesn't really, um, you know, specify the actual physics of the two liquids flowing next to each other. Uh, some of maybe more familiar types of knowable unknowns would be, you know, you're sitting at the early design stage, you don't know how the building design will unfold. And so that is also an unknowable, uh, unknowable unknown. You could wait uh, until more design details become available, or you could chase down your design team and say, okay, you know, why don't we, can you tell me some more specifications uh, instead of me making assumptions? Um, so whether these design details are known or unknown, you know, they can contribute to epistemic type of uncertainty. Aleatory uncertainty are sources of uncertainty that are just not knowable, like tomorrow's weather. No matter how hard I try, no matter what I effort I put in, there will always be this element of um, uncertainty in, say, tomorrow's weather, which I, I really cannot resolve. So these are two different types of uncertainty. Um, and so in this presentation today, I will talk about a uh, little bit about both of these. And if we also look at the design process, followed by design construction and building operation, um, you know, we, we are trying to track performance using different tools. Uh, these are just some examples uh, where we, you know, tools of or rating methods that are helping us track performance in various parts of the building's lifetime. So some methods, some rating methods like the EDGE program or LEED, Briam, et cetera, they are mainly focusing on design process and a little bit of construction, others looking at operation. So in part, I have two parts of my presentation today. Part one, I'm going to limit myself to the design process itself and uncertainties that come from just what is unknown during the early design stage. And so the scope of the uncertainty is limited to the design process itself. And part two, if we have 
time limited questions then we can go to part two which uh, in which i will try to link the kind of concerns a designer could have while they are still conceptualizing that is the building but are worried about the standards that they will held up to when they go into operation phase and so uncertainties like uh, you know who will be the occupant how will they operate the building whether etc um, these will certainly in, impact the building's energy use once the building is operational but should we be planning for them while we are in the conceptual design stage and to what extent can we plan for them so that's part two of my presentation today a, in part one i will talk about epistemic sources of uncertainty and mainly talk about um, the unknowns that are um, prevalent at the early design stage uh, and so talk about this early phase of the design process and here i will talk about you know what is the reliability of decisions that we can make at the early design stage and uh, in case they are not reliable what are we losing by making somewhat unreliable decisions okay so let's get into part one i'll talk through an example of you know, say a, a, a site where you know you you're given certain types of uh, you know you basically have a design problem in front of you there's a there's a plot of land that's surrounded by some built environment around it you know what far to build you know the building type maximum height these restrictions can exist and what's typically done in such a situation is that the architect will propose two or more design solutions that meet the design requirements and then increasingly using building performance simulation tools we are trying to assess various uh, design options that may be on it on the table at a given point in the design process say over um, you know energy use access to daylight overheating potential or potential to overheat and then the question in front of the architect and the design team is okay which which design should we proceed with which is more likely to comply with our performance requirements that we have um, applied on this particular project um, you know there's you know inputs from all kinds of um, uh, bodies city planners municipal bodies everybody is pushing that BB, you know, building performance simulation tools need to be used as early as possible in the design process because that's when all the big decisions are being made. Like, think about these two massing schemes. Uh, there, there's a huge difference in terms of not just in terms of what's happening inside these buildings, but what is happening on the outside, you know, the kind of spaces that will be created. So, this is a big decision to make. And then, of course, there, you know, simple things like aspect ratio of buildings, orientation of buildings, we know. That these decisions have a deep impact on the performance potential of the buildings but when we are doing these simulations um, i think anyone who has set up a simulation model knows the the hundreds of inputs that need to go into a simulation model and then when you think about setting up a model for these very conceptual designs you know that all these hundreds of inputs will be basically assumed values and we don't really know how each of these individual designs will progress as the design process unfolds. What kind of fa facade design details, what kind of interior layouts will show up inside these, we don't really know. Uh, the architects want to keep the you know, nature of uh, the design problem simple, design question simple. They really want to get an answer here so they can uh, just continue to build one massing scheme. Uh, so, here is here is a bit of a contradiction where you know we know we are relying on a lot of assumed inputs when we want to get some performance estimates on these things um, at the same time maybe we don't want to wait until all of those assumptions are converted into actual uh, numbers or specifications so this uh, sort of situation you know um, where the performance based results may suffer from a lot of uncertainty at the early design stage which may only get resolved to some extent by the time you reach the final design stage um, but at the same time we have to continue we have to keep making design decisions we cannot wait uh, so that's that's the conundrum and various researchers have tried to you know a first just quantify how much uncertainty can exist uh, and you know given various kinds of design problems and contexts 
uh, what are these important sources of uncertainty um, for each design stage. Uh, also, how do you tackle this? Um, there's a number of tools as well on the table on you know which can help you resolve all this. Uh, in this particular talk, I will focus more on this third item, which is what is the impact of this uncertainty on the quality of design decisions you can make? And so what is the chance that you will make, you could make incorrect decisions because there is so much uncertainty? Okay, so we come back to this same problem where we want to choose from these two matching schemes, but we don't know how exactly this process will unfold. So uh, here I want to compare, uh, I've tried to compare, a somewhat sequential design process, which is I would call kind of business as usual. This is how we kind of try and proceed if we want to keep our efforts um, in terms of building performance simulation, number of models we set up as low. So what we would typically do is, you know, if we have these two schemes in front of us, we probably put in a bunch of assumptions. So for example, you know, wind the wall ratio, et cetera, all these things are put in, uh, default values, et cetera, and you see which one performs better versus not and you pick the one that looks better. And I think the key assumption here in making a choice in this particular manner is that, you know, I, I, I just want to compare these two massing schemes. And so if I keep everything else the same, I should be able to see the effect of the form and I should be able to pick the better form. And then I can just continue working with that particular form and continue to explore it. Uh, maybe I will, distribute the window wall ratio a little bit differently it's not going to be the same on all facades add some fixed shading and here i have you know a, a high performance design apparently this kind of approach um as i mentioned is assuming that future design details that will show up have no interaction with the performance that you see by just looking at the form uh, and that the effect of the form will not change or the relative effect of the form will not change um, as more and more design details become available. This sort of approach is being questioned by this uh, new standard we have from ASHRAE, which is, I think, quite interesting uh, in terms of its scope. I mean, typically we've had standards, protocols, modeling protocols, which say how to set up a simulation model. You know, what are, the various kinds of inputs and um, parameters to set up when you are setting up a simulation model. This particular standard is talking about what to model and how to make decisions using those simulation models. So it's really getting into a, a, a you know, a, a sort of a guideline or standard for the decision making process. And what this particular standard is saying is that it is perhaps better that if you have two or more design options in front of you that you optimize both of them and not reject one or the other simply by using all assumed inputs and you know uh, looking at it one factor at a time but optimize both and then you compare their performance and so you try and see um, you know you try and model these two forms at you know with combinations of you know, various kinds of facades, for example, at the early design stage, and then make your choice. Okay, so if we take the suggestion of um, ASHRAE 209, uh, let's see what happens to the performance of these two massing schemes. If we follow, you know, kind of that sequential approach I showed you versus this ASHRAE approach, which asks that do not reject any option until you have optimized both of them to some degree. Okay, so let's see here is here is my you know basic scheme for um you know what ashray 209 is asking us to do here are my two schemes and here is my performance metric uh this is spatial daylight autonomy so access to daylight uh and so on this particular metric more is better so the higher this percentage over here the better it is and so this is where i stand if i take if I just compare the forms and everything else is assumed inputs. Okay, and yeah, so just comparing using the forms kind of at the very basic level. And so here, scheme A 
is marked by the black arrow and the scheme B is the orange arrow. And scheme A looks better and substantially better than scheme B. Now let's see what happens if we go to kind of step two and we say, okay, let's not decide this quickly. Let's see what happens if we had slightly higher window wall ratio versus lower window wall ratio. And now we see that actually at low window wall ratio, the gap between them is very small, hardly anything. Uh, whereas the difference between them is maintained at 40% window wall ratio. So this black shading area is defined, is kind of telling us the upper and lower value of performance for scheme A and scheme B. And then let's continue to add more design elements. And here, uh, following down the path of 20% window wall ratio, we, we find that their performance has even crossed over. And so there are instances where scheme A is actually poorer than scheme B. And so this shaded portion is now showing to what is happening to design options that emerge from this 20% window wall ratio where there is a complete reversal of ranks that you saw at the early design stage using default uh, window wall ratio of 30% say. So um, this is one example of what could happen if you decide to stone too fast and just based on like one factor at a time kind of approach that let me just look at the forums and if everything is the same, then I should be able to make a safe decision. Turns out not always. Okay. Let's look at another example. Uh, here, um, these two matching schemes, they kind of again started from a uh, decent difference between them. And later on, the performance begins to merge again for the 20% window wall ratio case. So initially you felt like actually by choosing scheme A, I'm doing something good. I'm choosing something that is better than B, but eventually they deliver very similar kind of performance. And so, you know, your belief that A is better than B is not really justified under some cases. And so I'm calling this insufficient performance gain. You could experience slight regret later on if somebody told you that actually you think A was better, but it's not, it wasn't really. And let's see another one example where the, this is on annual heating demand, where uh, you know, initially it seemed um, you know, the difference is small. Um, again, this is subjective, depends on how small you consider small, but we can see that at more, once more design details are input that um, the difference between them can also widen. And so ranks are actually created where initially maybe some particular designer could have rejected this as this is too small, I don't really care. Whereas later on had, you know, if more design, design details were available, there could have been cases where um, A or B actually could have emerged much better than A. So I'm calling this the latency effect where initially at the early design stage, the performance difference could remain hidden. It is also possible that, you know, in options that you don't see any difference that later on the difference can be revealed uh, depending on what design details you begin to input. To some extent, uh, I would reinterpret this and say that, you know, uh, the, the regret uh, that you would, you know, by you, that would be caused by just declaring these as equivalent uh, depends on how the facade design evolves. And then there could be other cases where nothing really happens. You know, the ranks are maintained as such, everything is fine. Like you know, the sequential design process assumes it to be. So I talked about three kinds of situations where um, some problems could emerge, where your initial assumption that you make while following this kind of sequential approach, one factor at a time kind of approach could go wrong. The ranks could be reversed, ranks could be created, or um, the ranks could be eliminated. So they kind of begin to deliver same kind of performance later on. Um, and so here we have, you know, the sequential approach versus ASHRAE 9, 2, 2, 209 approach. So if we compare these two, um, I want to show you um, that what happens if we take many, many such examples, then what do we find? Okay, so in each so what I did was I, I took a number of massing schemes and compared to them in this pairwise manner and then see, okay, what happens if I follow the sequential approach and just listen to what the sequential approach is telling me. I just make this quick choice at the box modeling stage versus what if I follow this sort of um, 
more effort, uh, search for a better optimal solution, uh, then, then what happens? You know, what do I gain here versus what do I lose here? Okay, so the other missing link here um, is that sometimes what can happen is, um, you know, if you, you let these two design, designs evolve, um, to, in order to compare the set of possibilities that will be created from this mousing scheme versus that, what uh, is also done in this particular process is to do a head-to-head -head comparison, to do a peer-to-peer -peer comparison. So I'm only comparing, you know, for example, if you take massing scheme one and you apply a specific window wall ratio and a specific type of window distribution and a specific type of pitch shading, and you do exactly the same on the other massing scheme, then how do they compare? So we are really comparing the counterparts of the design evolution of the design process one-to-one. I'm not comparing the average of this to the average of that because we don't build the average building. I'm only going to build one specific version of this massing scheme and only one specific version of that massing scheme, depending on whichever I choose. So the regret that I will show you that I could be experienced is calculated by doing this head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, if we do do that head-to-head -head comparison that I talked about, um from scheme a and scheme b um, then what we see here is that you know we let the design process evolve uh, and we see you know what are the different types of future facade designs that could be put up on these massing schemes um, we do find instances where you know scheme b is better whereas others where scheme a is better and so in the sequential design process, if I follow the sequential, A would be chosen. Um, and then these are the cases that I would miss. I would never even know that these possibilities existed. These I could only spot if I do that, you know, kind of wait and see kind of approach. Uh, actually 209, uh, optimize both solutions and then make my choice. Okay, so just to illustrate a bit more what's happening behind the scenes. So, Next step was uh, I did this sort of experimental approach to see how often could I come across situations of regret like this. I mean, this sequential design process, which I talked about, is, is of course simpler, low effort. And if that delivers good results, we should do that. You know, there is no point in getting into this whole business of running hundreds of simulations and then, you know, making simple decisions. If you can do it simple, the simple way, then that's great. So, the idea was to test it out experimentally. So we set up a bunch of massing schemes, uh, all of the same FAR on the same site. And I chose two at a time and fitted them against each other as if they were competing design proposals from an architect. Okay. So this was, I just continued to pick two at a time and fitted them against each other. And then in one step, I followed the sequential approach and the other, you know, I followed the ASHRAE 209 approach to see what happens and in how many cases do I experience regret. Okay, so simple. I took nine for 40 schemes like that. And then if we take two at a time, there's 780 pairs that I could create. And so we see results from those 780 pairs. And I mentioned risk of three types earlier. There's risk of rank reversal. There's the latency effect where ranks could be hidden from the sequential design process but would be revealed uh, if I you know do a account for the uncertainty and kind of future design possibilities that lie out there and there's a regret from insufficient performance gain where the risk is regret like how much do I stand to lose what are the better opportunities on the other side that I would not have seen from the sequential design process times the probability of experiencing that regret so how many future design possibilities can lead to regret, okay? So loss times the probability of loss is the risk. So if I look, I'm just gonna graphically present the results of my experiment where for daylight assessments, um, I found that one in five simulations or one in five comparisons of uh, two massing schemes at a time result in regretful decisions or high risk. Um, one in seven on heating assessments, so annual heating demand, and one in 17, I'm sorry, this is not cooling assessments, but overheating potential. Uh, 
So this is kind of the result of that particular experiment. Um, these results uh, are, of course, um, an artifact of the scope of the experiment. Um, you know, I only looked at facade design related uncertainties that exist at the conceptual design stage. There's so many others as well. And some of the other uncertainties like how much insulation, what will type, what will be the type of glazing, um, uh, these kinds of inputs could perhaps afflict heating demand and cooling or overheating potential related assessments much more. Uh, but in this particular case, the experiment was kept consistent across different metrics. So it's not that daylight assessments are more prone to error versus thermal uh, sort of overheating potential assessments. But within this experiment, this is what was found that if the there are in, you know if you do not know how big the windows are, where they are placed, and what kind of shading, then you're you know that is how likely you are to be making uh, incorrect decisions using a sequential decision making approach. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I want to show you what lies behind each of these dots, where you see the high risk. So behind each dot is each of these dots where these dots show what could happen in the future. Of course, it depends on you know, what these dots are telling us, depends on the pair of massing schemes that you are comparing. So if you just look at this uh, as a schematic, so again, this is what the sequential design process was telling us. It was telling me to say, for example, choose scheme A. But when I do this kind of risk assessment of what lies ahead or what could lie ahead, then this is what I see where, um, you know, let's say less than, little less than half of future design possibilities are telling me that in fact, both of these schemes in at least, you know, in about half, let, let's, I'm, I'm just gonna call it out, let's say 45% cases roughly, um, both schemes will actually deliver similar performance. And say, the, in the rest of the cases, there is potential for one scheme to deliver much higher or substantially higher performance than the other scheme. But who will win or who should win depends on when you know what facade will be designed. It really depends. And that A could be better or B could be better. It depends on what type of facade these details you will end up choosing. And so in this particular case, uh, you know, this kind of dot, this kind of future outcomes of possibilities are contributing to this high risk that I'm showing you here. Um, and um, yeah, this distribution could shift depending on you know how many high risk, low risk cases or the sort of unclear cases there are out there. Right, but this kind of sort of you know confusing sort of situation. Uh, can be resolved, uh, perhaps, and uh, sometimes it can be um, by just sorting this data out. So if I sort these data points by window wall ratio, now I can see that at actually 20% ratio and 30% window wall ratio, A is better, and there's only uncertainty and kind of mixed reactions when I choose 40% window wall ratio. And so some additional design decisions can sometimes immediately resolve uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty. And so if the designer was anyways going to choose, you know, do one of these window wall ratios, then there's, it's fine. If they don't even have to choose between 20% and 30%, they can just go with option A. So yes, there's uncertainty, there's risk, but reducing that uncertainty by a small amount also sometimes, or at least making a small number of decisions can reduce that uncertainty to a large extent. Uh, we just have to know when it is high enough that we do need to make that essential next step in the design process. So just to summarize the results of the experiments that I just showed you, sorry, there was a typo here. Um, you know, these were the kind of relative numbers we got, but of course these numbers, as I mentioned, are an artifact of the results from that particular experiment for a specific type of weather, uh, with a very specific type set of facades related possibilities, but I just wanted to share some more uh, general conclusions I would like to draw from this investigation. 
uh, first one being sometimes simplistic procedures of decision making can nullify efforts put into the analysis uh, as i just showed you you know even if you set up those simplistic box models so to say it takes effort to gather all the information to set them up to make all those assumptions gather proper data uh, but all that effort may sometimes be of no use uh, or of, uh, can even lead you in the incorrect decision because the decision making procedure is simplistic and uh, you know today we have tools that are making this kind of parametric exploration of design possibilities quite accessible so there they can be harnessed and decision more sophistication in the design in the decision making process i think is necessary when you want to do a more sophisticated exploration of your design space reliability in results is i think you all intuitively know that that garbage in garbage out um, but this is a little more nuanced that you know the degree of information you have about the building or design that you are trying to model that directly is related to reliability in results at the conceptual design stage i think sometimes then the need is not to ask you know whether i should choose option a or b but rather am i even ready to make that choice do i have enough design information to make that choice what is the metric i'm using and what are essential inputs for that metric i think that is that is important to ask yourself when setting a simulation model and not just work with you know okay whatever design information the designer gave you i'm just going to work with it and rest will be assumed um, there should be some consideration of what are we trying to get at what are we evaluating um, so this is a little more linked to uh, the particular study i showed you where we are using this risk and opportunity loss to assess the um, you know quality of decision making um which is which was found to be linked to both the model level of detail and the design path you follow so yes more design information is useful uh, can increase the reliability of your decision making but it's also somewhat path dependent so um you know say for example when you're setting up a daylight simulation model if you are modeling or if you know that your design is going to lean towards lower window wall ratio that the risk may be higher and that you need to model set up your models a little more carefully than if you had big large windows it doesn't matter as much um, and then at least if you look at this particular the, the experiment that i just showed you it does seem like the scale or the degree of improvement and quality of decision making that ash rate 209 can bring uh, can be important to individual users um, so for example for daylight simulation we found that one in five cases could be wrong that means that for every fifth if you know for example a consulting firm as a practice across the board is following that sequential decision making process that on every fifth project they could be making incorrect decisions and so you know many times when these standards and kind of guidelines are formulated we the anticipation and the view is that okay you know if if a number of buildings, if a number of projects apply these standards or methods, that overall we will begin to see the benefit. Um, so, for example, you know, all uh, kind of energy performance standards rating methods, their you know main premise is that we need to expand the number of people who are using it, and then we will see some substantial effect. Uh, I think here ASHRAE 209 is relevant to indiv individual firms as well at that scale. Right? Uh, not just at the industry level, but to individual firms that it makes sense to use more robust decision-making methods. So I think uh, this is this was part one where uh, I tried to show you what are the benefits of acknowledging the uncertainty that exists at the conceptual design stage and what are the benefits of bringing it in and uh, taking it into account into the decision making so maybe we can do a short q a now and then if there's a good amount of time left then we can go into part two is that possible there is 
be something. Uh, so do we have a question from anyone? I don't see anything on the question pane or people mm -hmm. can raise their hand. Anyone has any question? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe we can proceed. Um, yeah. yeah, there is, I think there is one. LOD okay. is level of design. Okay. Is that correct? Somebody is asking level whether, of detail. Level of detail. Okay. Shiva, it level is of uh, it's also level of detail. Sometimes uh, it's also abbreviated as level of design development, um, which I, I, at least in this context, uh, yeah, it would mean the same thing. Okay, so let me see, I mean, I'll, I'll proceed and I, I think sometimes you also need time to mull over things and uh, process. So, okay. Good. Okay, so this is. Okay. So, part two, as I mentioned. Um, you know, I want to talk about what happens to a designer who is sitting here again at the conceptual design process, I mean, conceptual design stage, and he or she knows that they will be subjected to performance evaluations when they go into operation and they will be subjected to uh, weather related uncertainties. They cannot really anticipate in much, too much detail on, you know, what kind of occupancy scenarios we will enroll, uh, uh, what will be the uh, operational setup like so should they already continue to worry about it or you know will regular uh, you know kind of following more procedural prescriptions of the codes will that be enough and then operational tweaks can be made later on you know this is a kind of dilemma that you could be dealing with so in part one i talked about deterministic compliance methods which apply to you know which limit their scope to the design process and while you are in the design phase whereas post-occupancy compliance methods, which are beginning to come to the fore, given the sense of urgency with which we need to control our energy use in buildings, also concerns relating the performance gap that, you know, I think people are leaning towards these more and more. Um, of course, there's many questions also that come up that are coming up, will come up, continue to come up as we transition into post-occupancy compliance methods. Uh, question one could be, you know, to what extent should the building, like the physical uh, components in the building and the envelope and shape and geometry and these, you know, hard elements of the building, to what extent should these be held responsible for performing under all conditions when they are traditionally tested under standard test conditions, you know, when you are in the design process. And it's again difficult to anticipate what kind of situations will unroll, what kind of, you know, uh, different situations should be prepared for while still in the design process stage. And then, yeah, when and how can we plan for post-occupancy compliance methods? So I'm just going to talk about this particular question, which we again explored through a, the same setup where you have a given site and you have two design options in front of you and you are thinking now of uh, not in terms of the uncertainties that are coming from the immediate design process, uh, but that you know that this particular project that you know you want to get into, uh, you will be subjected to post-occupancy performance thresholds that you will have to meet. So which option is better from that point of view? Okay, so which one to build? Same question. Uh, so 